Hello, everybody. I'm Allison Cuddy, the Artistic Director of the Chicago Humanities Festival, welcoming you to this program on hate speech. Tonight's event is the last in a deep dive series curated by the constitutional expert and legal scholar at the University of Chicago, Jeff Stone. If you missed the two previous conversations Jeff hosted, exploring the connections between national security and freedom of the press or social media and democracy, please check out our YouTube channel or go to our website, chicagohumanities.org. And while you're there, you can also look at the rest of our spring schedule. There's lots more coming or support us if you're able with thanks. Thank you to our captioner for making this program accessible. You can activate captioning right here in YouTube. And this series is generously underwritten by the Robert R. McCormick Foundation, a longtime supporter of the festival. Thank you so much. So now on to the program. Tonight, Jeffrey Stone hosts a conversation with Marianne Franks, who's professor at law, who's professor of law at University of Miami School of Law, and Nadine Strozen, professor emerita at New York Law School and the immediate past president of the American Civil Liberties Union. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Jeff, Marianne, and Nadine. Thank you, Allison. I'm delighted to be back and of the host this uh, discussion, which I'm sure will be quite lively on hate speech. Um, I'll begin with about a seven or eight minute introduction. And then um, Marianne Franks and the Dean Strassen and I will have a discussion about the various issues. And then there'll be time at the end for questions. So the First Amendment prohibits government mm -hmm. from abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. Now, that may sound pretty speech protective, but the hidden problem is in defining exactly what we mean by the freedom of speech that may not be abridged. What exactly does that phrase mean? When the Supreme Court first confronted this question just over a century ago, it embraced a surprisingly weak definition of the freedom of speech. Indeed, in a series of decisions, consistently upholding the convictions of individuals for criticizing America's participation in World War I, the court held that the First Amendment does not protect speech if the speech has even the tendency to cause harm. Over time, the court, inspired in particular by the powerful dissenting opinions in these cases by Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes and Louis Brandeis, gradually moved towards a more speech protective understanding of the First Amendment. But this was a long, arduous, and uneven process. In Beauharnais versus Illinois, decided in 1952, for example, the court first encountered a case involving what we would today call hate speech. At this point, the court was still at a relative low point in its First Amendment jurisprudence, and it was still reluctant to give all that much protection to free speech. Indeed, only one year before Beauharnais, the court, at the height of the McCarthy era, upheld the convictions of all of the leaders of the Communist Party of the United States on the theory that advocacy of communism had the potential to undermine the stability of our nation. In Beauharnais, the court faced a somewhat different issue. Joseph Beauharnais, the president of the White Circle League, organized the distribution of a leaflet, calling on the mayor and city council of Chicago, and here I quote, to halt the further encroachment harassment and invasion of white people, their property, neighborhoods, and persons by the Negro. The leaflet called for, quote, the self-respecting white people in Chicago to unite, warning that if persuasion and the need to prevent the white race from becoming mongrelized by the Negro will not unite us, then the aggressions, rapes, robberies, knives, guns, and marijuana of the Negro surely will. As a result of this expression, Beauharnais was prosecuted and convicted under an Illinois statute declaring it unlawful for any person to distribute any publication that, quote, portrays the depravity, criminality, unchastity, or lack of virtue of any class of citizens of any race, color, creed, or religion, which publication exposes such citizens to contempt or derision. Beauharnais maintained that his conviction violated his rights under the First Amendment, 
in his right to freedom of speech. But the Supreme Court, in a sharply divided five to four decision, upheld the constitutionality of his conviction. In an opinion by Justice Felix Frankfurter, the court reasoned that just as libel of an individual is not protected by the First Amendment, libel of groups of individuals should also be unprotected. The four dissenting justices made several counter arguments, including the argument that speech that may cause harm cannot be punished unless, in the words of Holmes and Brandeis, it creates a clear and present danger of grave harm, which was not the case in Beauharnais. And as Justice Hugo Black's words in a separate dissent opinion, if there be minority groups who had this holding as their victory, they might consider the possible relevancy of this ancient remark, quote, another such victory and I am undone. Over the next quarter century, the Supreme Court's First Amendment jurisprudence shifted gradually but dramatically towards the view of the dissenters in Beauharnais. A critical illustration of the shift involved the famous Skokie controversy in 1977. At that time, Skokie had a population of roughly 70,000 persons, 40,000 of whom were Jewish, and approximately 5,000 of whom were survivors of the Holocaust. Frank Collin, the leader of the National Socialist Party of America, announced that he intended to hold a march, including Nazi uh, armbands and flags um, in Skokie, to protest Skokie's policies that limited his freedom of speech. Skokie officials objected and basically said that they would prohibit the march, which they claimed would promote hatred against persons of the Jewish faith or ancestry and inflict serious emotional distress on the Jewish residents of Skokie. The courts, following Supreme Court precedents in the years after Beauharnais, held that Skokie's restrictions violated the First Amendment and that the city could restrict the Nazi speech only if it could prove that their speech would create a clear and present danger of grave harm, a standard that the city could not meet. In the more than 40 years since Skokie, many lawyers, scholars, and activists have argued that the First Amendment should not protect something called hate speech because such expression serves no legitimate First Amendment value and causes significant harm. During that time, though, the Supreme Court of the United States has made clear that government cannot constitutionally restrict speech because the speech expresses a particular point of view, unless the government can satisfy the essentially insurmountable clear and present danger standard. Thus, the court has consistently and emphatically rejected the argument that something called hate speech can be punished consistent with the First Amendment. In short, the justices have concluded that such expression is merely a point of view. And although many people may see it as problematic, it is fundamentally no different than anti-war speech, communist speech, Black Lives Matter speech, anti-abortion speech, or pro-gay rights speech. In short, without a single dissenting vote in over half a century, the court has held that the effort to suppress so-called hate speech is merely a constitutionally impermissible effort to silence a point of view that many people disapprove of. That, the court has held, is wholly incompatible with the central principle of the First Amendment. As Justice Samuel Alito explained in 2017, in the case of Mittal v. Tam, quote, the idea that the government may restrict speech expressing ideas that offend others strikes at the very heart of the First Amendment. Speech that demeans on the basis of race, ethnicity, gender, religion, age, disability, or any other similar ground is indeed hateful. But the proudest boast of our free speech jurisprudence is that we protect the freedom to express the thought we hate. And as Justice Anthony Kennedy added in a separate opinion in that case, quote, a law that can be directed against speech found offensive to some portion of the public can be turned against minority and dissenting views to the detriment of all. The First Amendment, he said, does not entrust that power to the government's benevolence. Instead, our reliance must be on the substantial safeguards of free and open discussion in a democratic society. The key question, of course, is whether that approach makes any sense and whether it is in fact as convincing as the current justices believe. It's now my great pleasure to introduce our two wonderful contributors 
to this evening's discussion, Mary Ann Franks and Nadine Strassen. Mary Ann is a professor of law and the Michael R. Klein Distinguished Scholar at the University of Miami Law School. She is a nationally recognized expert on the intersection of civil rights and technology. She is the author of the award-winning book, The Cult of the Constitution, Our Deadly Devotion to Guns and Free Speech. And last year, she was awarded a grant from the Knight Foundation to support research for her second book, Fearless Speech, which will be published in 2022. Nadine Strassen is a distinguished constitutional scholar who has served from 1991 to 2008 as president of the American Civil Liberties Union. And since 1988, she's been a member of the faculty of the New York Law School, currently serving as a John Marshall Harlan Professor Emeritus. Her most recent book, Hate, Why We Should Resist It With Free Speech and Not Censorship, has won national and international acclaim. So Marianne, let me turn to you to begin our conversation. Thanks very much, Jeff. I want to start out by saying that I really struggle with the concept or the term, I should say, of hate speech. I think that there are, there's a story here to be told about why that term entered our vocabulary. And at the, there was a time, I think, when uh, it made some sense to speak of hate speech and have an understanding of what that meant that was fairly consistent. But I think in more recent years, the term has become increasingly imprecise and very often now is invoked to cast a shadow essentially over any claim um, in favor of regulation of speech. And so it, it's used, I think, now as kind of a scare word to say, oh, hate speech, that means you're just trying to stop people from saying things you don't like, which of course sometimes is the definition that people are using. But I like precision in terms. And so I think it's much more effective to speak about the different categories that people are interested in when they make references to things that are sometimes collectively referred to as hate speech. Um, you know, I've noted this before um, in other contexts that the statement, the First Amendment doesn't protect hate speech or the First Amendment does protect hate speech, that both of those statements are equally meaningless because hate speech is not a legal term. Um, if we're thinking of things like you can't regulate, the First Amendment will not allow you to stop someone from saying that they um, don't like you on the basis of your race, et cetera. Well, that's true enough, of course. But if what we're meaning is that we can't um, threaten someone, right? If we can't um, discriminate against someone verbally at work, well, the First Amendment actually does allow you to prohibit those types of things. So if depending on what we're talking about, depending on the categories we're actually invoking, the First Amendment as a matter of jurisprudence sometimes does protect hate speech and sometimes it does not. The more interesting category for me or the more interesting inquiry for me is what when we start to break those things down, what is actually a coherent way to tell the story about what the court says we should protect and what we cannot protect. And when we talk about that story, um, the kind of background I think I'd want to set up is, in my estimation, what we've got with the First Amendment, despite all of the very rhetorically uh, reassuring phrases about how free speech is about everyone, and it's about being sure that even well-intentioned principles aren't used against vulnerable people, what we actually have, in fact, is a monoculture when it comes to the First Amendment. The people who wrote the First Amendment, the people who interpreted the First Amendment, most of the people who have brought claims under the First Amendment, most of their lawyers, have mostly come from a very specific narrow band of society, mostly white, mostly male, mostly straight. And what that means is the concept of free speech really goes, um, it, just despite the language, right, despite the assurances that it's the freedom for the thought we hate, you know, whose thought does Alito really hate, right? If you're defending white supremacy, if you're defending um, sexism, if you're defending racism, who really hates that kind of speech and who doesn't? So I think we have to be a lot more clear-eyed and skeptical about, you know, Supreme Court's own interpretation or description of what they are they claim to be defending and actually look at the cases, look at the kinds of things that were recognized as exceptions to the First Amendment and why they are. Why is child pornography an exception? Why is fraud um, an exception? Why is food and drug labeling an exception? Why is obscenity an exception? Because if what we're really saying is you can't use the first, you cannot um, regulate offensive speech consistent with the First Amendment, then the whole category of, of obscenity doesn't make any sense. So I think one thing that we have to do in this conversation is reset and get away from 
this kind of catchphrase of it does or does not protect hate speech and say, well, actually, if you look at what the court has said about what's protected and what's not, it actually raises a lot of questions about what offensiveness, um, how that plays a role, and just basically how the court actually sees harm. When does the court think that something is harmful enough to be regulated? And it's not that rare of a, uh, of a circumstance. It's threats. It's fighting words up to a certain point. It's things like fraud, securities regulation, price fixing, food and drug labeling, Title VII, Title IX, um, anti-discrimination laws, generally speaking. It's a pretty big category. And so I think one thing that is really important in this conversation is to decide what exactly is the target that we're focusing on and get the description right in terms of what the Supreme Court has said, and then talk about normatively speaking, whether or not we think they've gotten it right. And I'll, you know, I can say more about this later. I don't think that for the most part, they have gotten it right, but that should be a separate question and a very specific question. Thank you very much, Jeff and Marianne. And I agree with much of what Marianne said. Uh, let me point out what the what the significant areas of agreement are and then point to one really major disagreement. So I, I could not agree more with Marianne, and I've made this point even when I'm speaking uh, on my own, uh, that the term hate speech, which is bandied about by everybody, to probably mean nothing more or less than what they hate or what they consider to be hateful. And we've seen that term applied for, uh, to everything from uh, the name of the former president of the United States has been deemed to be hate speech. And what Black Lives Matter groups are advocating has also been deemed to be hate speech, not to mention Blue Lives Matter and All Lives Matter. And on some campuses, even calling for free speech has been deemed hate speech. Uh, Marianne is exactly right when she uh, stresses that it has no agreed upon legal meaning precisely because in contrast to obscenity, which is a subset of sexually oriented speech that the Supreme Court has said, if you meet the definition we have prescribed for obscene content, then that is excluded from the First Amendment altogether. It has never done anything analogous with respect to so-called hate speech. It has never defined a category of speech based on its content, its hateful or hated content, and said, by virtue of that content, it is excluded from First Amendment protection. As Jeff said, the court has repeatedly refused to do that, consistent with what it has called the bedrock principle underlying our system of free speech. And that is usually called viewpoint neutrality or content neutrality, that government may never restrict, restrict speech solely based on disfavor, disapproval, vague fear uh, of its viewpoint, its content, its message, or its ideas. However, when you get beyond the content of the speech and you look at it in its overall context, as Marianne rightly said, speech with a hateful content or any other content, if it satisfies certain contextual criteria, can and should be subject to punishment. So one uh, such category, that, and, and the, the way that that principle uh, is, is, is often described is the emergency concept. It used to be called clear and present danger uh, because that term was manipulated and became very um, abused and interpreted extremely loosely. Uh, most judges now avoid that term and, and talk instead about an emergency, which is a concept that harks back to the old Brandeis and, and um, Holmes dissents that Jeff referred to, that if in a particular context, the speech directly imminently causes or threatens certain specific serious harms, then it can and should be punished. And, and one such category that satisfies the emergency principle that's been in the news a lot lately since January 6th is intentional incitement of imminent violence that is uh, violence or lawlessness that is likely to happen imminently. So if a hateful uh, idea is expressed in that context that satisfies that, that contextual standard for in punishable incitement, uh, then in that context, the hateful speech can be punished. 
Uh, but beyond that, it cannot. And, and Marianne, my assessment of all of the exceptions that the Supreme Court has made, or I shouldn't even call them exceptions, all of the factual and contextual circumstances in which the Supreme Court has said that uh, speech can be punished, and you mentioned a number of them, including fraud, um, and child pornography, um, and extortion would be another example, bribery, quid pro quo, sexual harassment. Uh, those kinds of speech either directly cause harm uh, just by virtue of the communication, right? Sleep with me or I'm going to fire you uh, or offering a bribe to a government official and so forth. Or they are so tightly and directly connected to, uh, to an imminent harm that they can be punished. The one exception where speech is allowed to be punished purely based on its content uh, is obscenity. You know, Jeff's a great expert. Jeff, there may be other exceptions, but I think that's the major one. And the obscenity exception, I think, is not at all justified. M much more importantly, many Supreme Court justices have not considered it to be justified. Last time the court uh, revisited that exception was way back in 1973 in a five to four decision. And since then, many justices all across the ideological spectrum have, have called for abandoning that standard. Now, uh, I, I want to call this, uh, wrap this up so I can hear more from Marianne, but uh, I'll, let me, why don't I just say uh, where I think I disagree with you, Marianne, if I, if I understood what you said. So maybe I'll just say it and, and not go into uh, my reasons. And that is, I believe that no matter who wrote the First Amendment, no matter what their intent may or may not have been, that it has been an absolutely essential engine for the advocacy and increased protection of rights of those who were excluded from we the people. Um, at the time that the Constitution was adopted, and that if it had not been for robust freedom of speech, uh, we would not have had an abolition movement, a civil rights movement, reproductive freedom, women's rights, anti-war, socialist labor unions, everybody who is trying to change the status quo, uh, speaking as a dissident minority political perspective or as a uh, ethnic or other uh, minority group, absolutely dependent on robust freedom of speech. And it's no coincidence, therefore, that the Supreme Court's great free speech protective decisions came about uh, through the civil rights movement and largely in cases that were, were the immediate beneficiary of the speech protection uh, were civil rights demonstrators. Uh, let me, if I can, clarify a bit about First Amendment doctrine for our audience, and then also ask the two of you how you think about this particular proposition I'll put forth. Um, so for the audience, it's important to note that when the government regulates the content of the message of speech, that is the government says that the message you are communicating causes harm and therefore we can prohibit it. The general approach the court now embraces is that unless you can pr pr prove a clear and present danger or an emergency or basically something which is never provable, frankly, you cannot prohibit speech because the message itself is thought to be harmful. Um, that's something the court came to over, over 100 years of figuring it out. But it has an exception for what the court has called low value speech. That is the court has held for most of our history that there are certain categories of expression that can be regulated in terms of its content because it's not the kind of speech the First Amendment should be understood or was intended to um, protect. So obscenity is one example. Uh, libel defamation is another. Um, fraud, perjury are other examples. Threats, uh, fighting words, Mary Ann mentioned, uh, commercial advertising. Um, in these categories, the court has said the standard of clear and present danger or emergency, a standard that basically can never be satisfied, does not apply because this is not the kind of speech that the First Amendment should be understood as protecting. These are not the kind of messages that the First Amendment protects. And given the fact that that doctrine plays a significant role in our First Amendment jurisprudence, why shouldn't something called hate speech, illustrated by the speech in Beauharnais, for example, 
be treated as the kind of expression that our First Amendment and our Constitution does not protect because it is incompatible with the fundamental values and goals of our Constitution. Would you accept that as a proposition? Uh, Marian? This is like law school class. <laughs> this is it. Um, getting flashbacks now. But uh, you know, the, the question is, is phrased this way is an interesting one. That is, do we think that, I guess one way to answer it is to say this, it is no less consistent or coherent to say the kind of speech that was at issue in Beauharnais is prohibited by the First Amendment, then I think, you know, longstanding um, exceptions and longstanding doctrinal um, issues, it, it's, it's no more incoherent than that. In other words, the, the bottom line, um, and I certainly agree with Nadine that, that the First Amendment can be used and has been used in many good ways. I think that's not in dispute. The question is really about the boundaries. It's never about whether or not full stop is the First Amendment good. Sure, it, it, like any law, it can be used for good. And I give a lot of credit mostly to the people who used it and took um, a stand and actually fought for the, in their interpretation of um, their own protections under the First Amendment. I think that's where the credit mostly lies. Um, so it can be used for good. The question is these, these boundary issues. So what about the, the speech in question in Beauharnais? I think the real question is that we have to be candid about how what is really going on in Supreme Court jurisprudence is whose harms count. And if for a brief moment, the court's willing to say these harms count, we actually think that this is a significant harm, then, it, then you know, that's the world we get. If the court then moves on to say, we no longer think that it counts, but we still continue to think that obscenity counts and we still think that libel counts. Um, all that's really happening is we're getting a very political in some ways. And I don't mean partisan wise, I just mean political in the sense of whose harms and whose risk of harm are we willing to tolerate and which ones are we going to reject? And if, um, you know, I think there's a lot to be said for the secondary effects doctrine, for the idea that it's not just about being upset that someone is calling you a racial slur, that, you know, I don't know too many people who are actually really enforcing that as an idea to say hurt feelings or feeling whatever way one does about an ugly name. It's not really so much the issue as it is, are there secondary effects? And when it comes to racist and sexist speech, we actually do have a wealth of empirical knowledge now that shows that there are real effects, right? It's not just, oh, I, don't, I didn't feel comfortable that day. It's there are actual physical health effects associated with constant barrages of racial, um, uh, racial slurs and other types of racist um, speech. There are obviously consequences for people's careers. There's consequences for their personal lives. There's consequences for their safety. We can talk about January 6th. We can also talk about the Atlanta massacres and about how the weaponization of the COVID crisis and the references and the racialized references to um, the disease has directly impacted the safety and security of Asian Americans. It has done that. So if we're going to talk about the hard questions, let's talk about the hard questions, which is what about the situations where speech is deliberately being weaponized in order to blur the lines between speech and conduct to make it more likely that someone is going to get hurt? Um, this focus on clear and present danger on eminence is really, one could say, an, a ridiculous way to draw the line because that's not how speech works. Speech is cumulative. Speech does all these powerful things, and that's the reason why we supposedly protect it. It can make a person um, see an entire race in a way that is objectifying and um, dehumanizing. It can help lead them down a path to hurting that person. If we've learned anything from history, we should know that speech is, in many cases, the beginning of hatred, is the beginning of harm, is the beginning of violence. Now, the question is, at what point are we going to say we will do something about that? Are we going to wait till people are massacred? Are we going to wait for another insurrection? Are we going to wait till people are, are dead? Um, or do we think that there's some way to actually be more interventionist when it comes to certain types of speech? And I think those are the really hard questions that we should be focused on. Well, I, I agree that those are important questions. Um, I'm, some of them are hard, but I, uh, I, I think some are, are not so hard. Um, for me, one, one question, Marianne, is uh, the potential and in many cases, actual harmful impact of speech. I have absolutely no doubt about that. I have never uh, based my opposition to increased pow government power to censor on any concept that the speech is not at least potentially and often 
uh, actually harmful in 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 many ways to many people. Uh, I and uh, I think everybody has experienced this. Many of us have been subject to hate speech, but all of us have been uh, terribly wounded in ways that have psychological and physiological manifestations. And very importantly, free speech manifestations, right? Uh, we, the three of us were talking before the program started that we've all seen as professors, um, the, the silencing impact that hurtful, hateful words can have. And I wanna be very precise here that the, uh, these span a very wide ideological spectrum. Uh, there's been a slew of anti-Semitic speech that's very uh, upsetting to me, given the fact that my father was a Holocaust survivor and he barely uh, came out of the Buchenwald concentration camp alive. And, and it, it, you know, raises terrible, um, I'm not going to use a scientific term, but feels traumatic to me as an individual this week. Um, but uh, the other question we have to ask is, what is the impact of increasing government power to intervene? Uh, we, you say that you don't like the clear and present danger test. I don't either, Marianne, but let's look at the current definitions of intentional incitement to imminent violence, the current definition of a punishable true threat, uh, the current definition of punishable harassment. Uh, do you think those do not go far enough? Would you offer an alternative definition and I would say, this to me is the hard question. The devil is in the details and it's not cost free to loosen up the causal connection between speech and potential harm. The more slack we give the government, the more we unfurl uh, the current emergency test and go back to the bad tendency test that Jeff described earlier, the more discretion we're gonna give to government. And especially if you believe that we have a government and a system with entrenched racism and other forms of discrimination, it seems to me the last thing you wanna do is give to that structure a more discretionary power that's going to be wielded in subjective terms, uh, generally to uh, en en entrench further the status quo and to disempower further those who are already excluded and marginalized. See, I would, I would that, sorry. Well, go ahead. Go ahead, Maria. See, I would take the part that you just described us. Now, I take that as the status quo. I take that as the way that the First Amendment is largely being used now is to reinforce the status quo. It is largely reinforced to enforce the powerful's um, grip on um, all markets, right? So not just the economic market, but the supposed free market and speech, and that it's actually attempts um, sometimes. And of course, as you say, the devil is in the details. It, it depends on what we're talking about. But I'll take one example that I'm fairly close to, and that affects Illinois. Um, Non-consensual pornography, also known as revenge porn. Uh, the, one of the things I have done as the head of the Cyber Civil Rights Initiative is drafted a model statute to criminalize the distribution of private sexually explicit material without consent. And since the work began in 2013, We've gone from three states that have criminal laws to 48 states that have them. And there's a federal law that has now been um, um, merged in a way into the Violence Against Women Act. And among the, you know, the state laws that were sort of early on, um, early movers was Illinois' law. And it was challenged on First Amendment grounds. And the Illinois Supreme Court ultimately decided that it survived a constitutional scrutiny and that the law was constitutional. Supreme Court denied cert, so that's where we stand. And I wanted there was to, another such decision just yesterday, wasn't there? Was, yeah. out of Texas, and and out of Texas, which which surprised many of us that the, <laughs> that the that the conclusion was actually basically the same, and that is now the sixth. Texas is the sixth state law that has been challenged and has come out um, that has reached termination in the state courts, and all of them have gone the same way, which is to say these laws comport with the First Amendment. Um, there's still one pending in, in um, Indiana uh, right now, um, one case. So there's a situation where um, when we talk about things like, you know, do you want to give the government more power? I think another way of phrasing this, although I, I completely recognize what you're cautioning us about, and Jeff has written so beautifully about this, about it's not so much that we don't want to do something about the speech, but do we trust the government to be the one to decide? And that's actually, of course, that's something that's absolutely right. 
But then the, the, the government is also us, right? That's supposed to be one of the promises of democracy is that, you know, think about the revenge porn laws. In most cases, what happened was victims came forward and said, this is ruining my life. It is silencing my speech. It is ruining my, my self-expression. It means that I don't have a job. I'm threatened every day. I had to move. I had to change my name. Those victims come forward at great cost to themselves. They appeal to their state legislators. Their legislators actually listen to them. Their legislators bring in experts to draft a law and they pass it. And then you have, you know, the ACLU and others coming in and saying, no, we don't like it. So we'd like to get it unpassed. To the we'd best like of my knowledge, they, the narrowly drafted laws have not at all been opposed by the ACLU. Yeah, I can promise you, Nadine, because I have been sitting in every room where this has happened. I, I have been on the other side of the ACLU and all of these fights, and it has been the ACLU to fight every sensible law that's been written. And Illinois was one of them. And it was absolutely devastating to watch them go to the mats to try to fight this law. I and can't so say I've read the Illinois law, but I read the opinion of the Texas court yesterday and I found it persuasive. Um, it seemed to me that it was a narrowly drafted law. I remember one um, over broad one, and I believe it was Arizona was one of the first. And it was written in a way that uh, could extend even to consensual sexual images, but this one seemed to be. So anyway, but I mean, Marianne, I agree with you. And I, I, I'm not going to speak for my ACLU colleagues. I'm speaking this for was not my family. point. Was, was yeah. not my, my point. But, so I think, but, but I think that a well-crafted law that, that to me satisfies, you know, whether you call it the emergency principle or clear and present danger, you're not punishing an idea. You are punishing, you know, uh, a, 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 an independent harm that has nothing to do with the idea that is being conveyed, if any. By, by that expression. So this is the, the reasoning that I too agree with, and it's the reasoning we have given for every one of the laws that we have tried to get passed. The ACLU has actually watered down our laws in most states because they thought, no, it's not about consent, it's about intent to harm. So this is, so, so directly in response to your question from before, which is would I change some of these definitions? Am I concerned about the current status um, of self-styled First Amendment defenders who say, you can't have a law that does this, that does this thing that addresses this very specific harm, unless you have as an element of the offense that they intended to cause this kind of harm. And in every state where we have fought that, we have, it, it has been extraordinary to see the number of civil libertarians who have said, oh, it has to be an element of the offense. Is that and now, I'm, I, I want to ask Jeff, and this is way beyond my expertise, Marianne, but um, I assume, is that because it's a criminal penalty and that intent is a, a, a prerequisite to be no. punished criminally? I mean, I teach criminal law, and this is one of the fights we've had to have over and over again. The idea that, yes, you have to have a mens rea, but a mens rea is not a motive. Mm -hmm. The idea that your, your motive has to be that you wanted to cause this person harm, as opposed to what is very often the motive, which is, I didn't mean to cause her harm. I just didn't think about her at all because women aren't really human beings to me. Or I, you know, yeah, lost yeah, because, because, I, because I wanted profits from it, right? So the argument, my, my point being that this is one of those interesting examples that puts the the um, these kinds of rhetorical questions of don't trust the government to the test. When the when the people rise up and say we think this is something that the law should address, and these are based on victim experiences and the attempt is made to try to say, let's articulate this as clearly as possible. And then you have a movement on the other side that says, no, 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 that's going to kill free speech. These are the, I'm all for having a conversation about the cost. And I'm telling you, this is what the cost has been, has been to fight in every one of these states to actually get a law that's reasonable and makes sense. And then we have to go and fight it in the courts all over again. And, you know, the, the, the well, idea- I think, there, I think there should be a struggle. I mean, seriously, uh, if there is a speech restriction or a law that is going to um, unintentionally, perhaps it wasn't the, the central design of the law, uh, but, but if it could be applied to speech that should be protected, that's a really important, those are really important discussions and debates to be had. Let me, let me intervene. We, we should open it up for questions pretty soon, but I want to intervene with one observation myself and then ask Nadine a quick question. Yeah. Um, the observation I want to make clear again is to educate the audience to yeah. the extent they're not experts on the First Amendment, is sure. that <clears throat> there's a difference in First Amendment jurisprudence between laws that restrict speech because the point of view expressed is seen as being harmful and laws that restrict speech because the speech itself is seen harmful independent of any particular point of view being expressed. So defamation, for example, or revenge porn um, or obscenity. Child pornography is another good example. Right, right. Commercial advertising. These are not ideas in particular that are being punished. In 
punishing people who criticize the World War I, who advocate communism, who advocate abortion rights, who oppose gay rights, or who engage in what we call hate speech, are all examples of situations where the government is punishing someone because the point of view they are expressing is thought to be harmful. And what Holmes and Brandeis and ultimately the court as a whole has come to embrace is the principle that the government cannot do that because we don't trust the government to decide which point of view on any, con any issue or any, any concept is acceptable or unacceptable because that's, that is completely contrary as Alito was saying and Kennedy was saying in the quotes I gave with the whole concept of democracy. We don't want government to make those decisions that you can't criticize the war, you can't criticize Black Lives Matter, whatever. However offensive those, that speech may be, you cannot have the government say you can't say that. Uh, we don't, and mainly because we don't trust the government to do it in a fair-minded way. I also want to just very briefly, and then we'll go to questions, ask you to make a quick observation about those countries that have hate speech laws. How have they worked? Because a lot of countries around the world do have these laws. Have they been successful? And, and I, I do want to say that those hate speech laws do what I think Marianne certainly has not advocated and may be opposing, and that is to uh, give government the power to punish speech because of disapproval of its viewpoint, even without showing any connect, direct connection uh, to imminent harm. So th those laws go very much back in the direction of bad tendency. And uh, there is certain, there is no correlation between countries that strictly enforce very strict anti-hate speech laws and um, a, a reduction or diminution in in hateful crimes or, or hateful speech. And a good example is Germany, which, by the way, did enforce very strict anti-hate speech laws during the Weimar Republic, during which Hitler rose to power. And the Jewish communities at the time said these laws were being uh, generally fairly enforced. There were a lot of prosecutions, a lot of convictions, and the Nazis used them as, as propaganda platforms to gain attention and sympathy they otherwise never would have. By the way, something similar happened in Skokie in the sense that the attempt to uh, to, to mute the messages of the neo-Nazis actually backfired. Uh, they, I, they sought a permit to demonstrate for 20 to 30 minutes in front of the village hall in Skokie. And they estimated probably wild overestimates that they would have 30 to 50 marchers. And they would have come and gone in a flash if there hadn't been an attempt to suppress that, that message. Instead, they got ongoing international attention for a couple of years. So they won the propaganda battle that, that was what they were seeking to, to wage in the first place. And Germany today still has some of the strictest anti-hate speech laws in the world that are very strictly enforced. And we know about the terrible um, crimes against Jews, killing of Jews, uh, attacks on synagogues, also on refugees, on immigrants. Now, one can't prove and counterfactual. Maybe the situation would have been even worse without those hate speech laws. But for those of us, all of us, I'm sure, are deeply committed to rooting out actually hateful attitudes and actions. And these laws clearly are not enough to do that. Uh, in fact, the European Commission Against Racism and Intolerance, which is responsible for monitoring the enforcement, all of the European countries have anti-hate speech laws. And in its last report, uh, ECRI, to use its acronym, said that counter speech speech denouncing hateful ideas, speaking up in support of those who are sought to be disparaged. Counter speech is much more likely to be effective than censorship. So that's another really important point that law doesn't have to be our only tool and it may not be the most effective. It may be uh, the least effective tool for going at the real problem here attitudes and, and discriminatory and violent actions. What I'd like to just point out too, though, is that as, as true as any of this might be, in our country, the country that prides itself on having this unique perspective on free speech, we are the country that elected Trump. We are the country that had a January 6th insurrection. We are the country that mows down black men in the street. We are the country that subjects women to extraordinary levels of sexual violence and objectification. 
So the idea that we're going to look at other countries and say, well, you see the problems they have, we have all those problems and more. And supposedly, we've got this very deferential approach to free speech that's supposed to serve as some kind of check against that. And my question always is, where's the empirical evidence that America is doing better on that front? And not just in terms of keeping our citizens safe, but also who actually gets to feel free to speak freely? I always ask my students in my First Amendment seminar, because we have so many international students and students who've spent time in other countries, do they think that sitting in this classroom in the United States that they are freer to speak than in England or in Germany, et cetera? And the answer is almost never yes. It, it is compared to some countries, but the idea that the United States has the unique formula for actually letting people speak and actually engaging in these ideas in a way that doesn't subject people to stalking and harassment and harm, but, you know, there's just no evidence of that because we're doing very badly as a country when it comes to equality, when it comes to keeping citizens safe and not being subjected to this kind of um, truly dehumanizing type of treatment. So, and to the point about counter speech, I just wanna say counter speech is a wonderful idea and it works in many contexts, but in many contexts it can't. You can't counter speak a threat. You can't counter speak to someone publishing your home address or your naked photos or your medical information. There are all kinds of speech that are simply that is simply unanswerable and we have to reckon with that and we can't keep defaulting to the position of more speech is better. And the other thing I want to say, especially when we're talking about vulnerable groups, is that counter speech is work. It is labor that people should not have to engage in and it is labor that keeps them from other things. And so as much as the concept may be interesting and it may actually produce good results, there's a cost to that as well. And there's a cost to shifting the burdens onto individuals, especially in situations where at least nominally, right, we think the government should be trying to take care of its most vulnerable citizens or at least not trying to actively harm them and not pursuing a path of omission and passivity to allow them to be harmed. Well, you made a lot of points, some of which I agree with, some of which I disagree with, but out of respect for the audience, let me confine myself to uh, to one point, Marianne, which is I, I too think that, well, I don't know if you think it's impossible. I, I think it's impossible to empirically demonstrate the impact of either free speech or restrictions on free speech because there's an infinite set of variables then that one would have to take into account uh, in comparing different legal systems, different cultures, different societies. I think perhaps uh, one comparison that can be made is within the United States itself. And when for all of the challenges that we have, uh, if you think that we are sliding back, I'm gonna disagree with you because I am very proud uh, of the progress that has been made and, and, and thanks in part to efforts by, uh, by all of us who are, who are here tonight. That, uh, and, and when you look at the period when the Supreme Court started to strongly protect free speech, including hate speech that as Jeff described in his introductory remarks uh, from in the 60s and 70s, that coincides, and I think it's not a coincidence, uh, with enormous progress on racial justice, enormous pro progress on gender justice, a whole series of equality movements that didn't even exist or come out of the closet. Literally, when we talk about LGBTQ plus uh, movements and so forth, and they were fueled by uh, loosening up restrictions on speech, including hate speech. But at the same time, it allowed Martin Luther King, whose speech was denounced as hate speech in Cicero, Illinois, by the way, just a few years before, before the Skokie situation. So I think that is uh, an interesting bit of, of data. So one question we have from our audience is, um, what would originalists say about all this? I know neither of you is an originalist, but <laughs> what do you think Antonin Scalia would say about this issue if um, he was given the opportunity? I, the, Marianne, do you, have, do you have a window into Scalia's thinking? Well, no, uh, <laughs> I think what I would say is, I, and I don't mean to be glib about this, but but I'm going to be a little glib. I'm going to say, who cares? Um, I don't I don't care what to the extent that originalism means something, and I and I say if right right to the extent because I mean Scalia is a good example of being an originalist when it served his purposes and and abandoning it when it didn't. It's 
it is a political position by and large. I know that there is such a thing as honest originalism. I, that's a whole conversation that one could have, but by and large, it's an attempt to lock us into a certain definition and a certain time frame that you know does not coincidentally benefit certain people and screws over everybody else. So I'm not that interested in that. But but I will point out, and this links a little bit to to somewhat uh, to something that Nadine said, which is yes, I, I I grant that there's this progress that was made, and and we can look to the civil rights movement and talk about how that's a victory of the First Amendment. But I also want to point out that the First Amendment existed during slavery and the First Amendment existed during Jim Crow and the First Amendment has existed all this time while the country was doing terrible things to most of its citizens. So the idea that 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 has somehow been protecting us or that there's some original idea there, so just to link it to this question, clearly not, right? There's clearly nothing about the original intent of the First Amendment that kept our country from um, subjugating and exploiting uh, you know, masses of people. But you're pointing to a general problem, which I think it really is is good to um, to to underscore, especially if the audience includes a lot of non-lawyers, which is that uh, none no provision in the Constitution is self-enforcing. You know, the entire Bill of Rights, not to mention the post-Civil uh, War amendments, were were largely honored in the breach, and that's why because you know it takes. The Supreme Court can't just reach out with a magic wand and say, you know, we're going to enforce the First Amendment. It takes uh, very brave plaintiffs, and you've saluted some of them, Marianne, but it also takes lawyers who are willing to go to court to, uh, to, to advocate their causes. And that's exactly why the NAACP, the ACLU, the American Jewish Committee were all founded uh, near the beginning of the 20th century to actually uh, translate the paper guarantees uh, of the Constitution into real rights for real people. I mean, my, my view is that, and this is not really about originalism, is that the single most important role of the judiciary when it comes to constitutional interpretation is to protect the powerless um, from abuse of government by those who are in control. And there are different ways of seeing that. One way is to say, who is powerless right now and we should protect them against laws. The other is to say, we don't trust the government to do certain things. And that's how the Supreme Court eventually embraced its notion of no, no laws are permissible if they restrict a particular point of view. That basically, if a majority of the American people pass a law that prohibits the expression of a particular point of view and they're allowed to do that, what they will use that power to do is to abuse the whole democratic system and to suppress speech by their critics. And that was evident from the very beginning with the Sedition Act of 1798, where Congress enacted legislation that for all practical purposes made it a crime to criticize the president and the Congress. And it was, it's the recognition that we don't trust democracy and we need to not trust democracy in order to protect democracy, ironically enough, is sort of central to the core understanding of, of the Constitution and in particular of the First Amendment. And I think that's, that drives much of the logic of what the court has come to do in the First Amendment context. There's all sorts of speech that the majority doesn't like in all sorts of ways, including now one would say anti-Vietnam War speech or, or anti-communist speech or anti-World War I speech or whatever, in which the court has come to say you cannot suppress that. You have to let people say those things that other people don't like, because that's ultimately how we get, make democracy work. You don't let the majority silence the minority, whoever the minority might be. Um, anyway, um, let's, let's turn to some we have four minutes left. Let's turn to some closing remarks. Mary Ann, do you want to go first? Sure. I, I appreciate this discussion, you know, for many reasons, because, of course, the, the concept of the First Amendment and freedom of speech has probably been more often invoked now than maybe ever before in history. Everyone wants to talk about it. And everybody has a view on it. And I think that that's wonderful in a certain sense, because it, it's the law should belong to everyone and the concept of freedom of speech should belong to everyone. And so there's great democratizing um, potential there. The concern though, um, is that people have very strong intuitions about freedom of speech. And um, I've used this expression before about how just like there's junk law and junk science, there's also I mean, junk science and pseudoscience, there's also pseudo law and, and junk law. And a lot of 
the uh, conversations around the First Amendment and free speech, especially around social media platforms, has really just gotten a lot of the doctrine very wrong. And that should tell us a few things. I mean, it should tell us that we are, as a society, not particularly constitutionally literate, and that we are very um, seduced by the idea of using the law and invoking the Constitution to justify our own selfish interests. And that's what my, my book, The Cult of the Constitution, is all about. And I would really caution, especially in the context of the First Amendment, about that. And I paralleled it to the Second Amendment and how so often, even though you don't necessarily think of those two camps as being on the same page, the concept of, you know, the answer to bad speech is more speech, let the government stay out of it, um, is very much what you hear in the gun context too, right? Oh, people are getting shot. Well, we'll just have more guns and other people will get shot or don't let the government regulate because you can't trust them not to take all of our guns. And I think we could do well to wrestle with the, with the with the similarities that have emerged from a certain kind of First Amendment absolutism and a Second Amendment absolutism, and to really check our own um, desires here and our own uh, intuitions about how we think the world should work, and make sure that we're not using constitutional principles to justify our self-interest, that we are actually using constitutional principles as a kind of test of our own interest to make sure that we're not trying to just litigate on our own behalf and not just trying to win for our tribe. So that's really the commentary I'd make here, especially when it comes to something as contentious and, and passionate um, as most people's feelings about free speech is to have that kind of check and to try to think about uh, universal principles and reciprocity and um, objectivity as opposed to responding emotionally. Thank you both very much. I'm sorry that we didn't have time for more audience questions. I feel very bad about that. Um, but I want to end by, by stressing a point that I stressed in my book, which Jeff mentioned, but I really want to emphasize uh, the title, Hate, Why We Should Resist It with Free Speech not censorship. And it's no coincidence that the only verb in that title is resist. My focus and my aim is, I hope, the universal one, Marianne, picking up on your theme of resisting hatred, reducing it, um, opposing, countering, curbing, discrimination, and stereotyping, promoting equality, dignity, diversity, inclusivity, societal harmony, all of the goals that people who advocate more restrictions on hate speech um, cite as their goals, and I absolutely share those goals. I am, however, convinced, based on looking at evidence from around the world throughout history, uh, in this country throughout history, listening to the testimony of human rights activists and international organizations around the world, that no matter how well intended, laws that give the government more power to crack down on hateful speech are at best ineffective and at worst counterproductive in advancing those goals. And they disproportionately, predictably disproportionately, silence the voices of the very disempowered and marginalized people and groups that they are intended to to benefit. So I don't end there. My concept of counter speech, Marianne, I couldn't agree with you more, is not the responsibility of those who are disparaged. It is the responsibility of every single person in this society. And I don't even like the term counter speech because it sounds too defensive. We have a, an affirmative responsibility proactively to uh, propound messages of equality and inclusion and belonging and to counter ideas that are the opposite. And I'm very heartened by uh, anecdotal evidence and social science studies that indicate that that kind of counter speech really does make a difference. Yes, you can say it's only words, but of course hateful speech is only words as well. And so for all of us who support uh, the goal of resisting hateful attitudes and actions, uh, please let's continue to vigorously exercise our free speech rights. Uh, we can make a big difference that way. Um, as we uh, come to a, a close, I'd like to underscore the Dean's point that uh, in a free society, it is incumbent upon citizens to express their views, defend their positions, and make clear what they believe to be 
fair and right and just, um, and not to be shy about that and not to take it for granted and to recognize that when they hear speech that they regard as degrading to other people and as insulting and as harmful, um, that whether or not the government can intervene, that they have a moral responsibility as citizens of a free society to step in and to express their views and to defend those who have been attacked and even to attack those who've engaged in the attacks with words, not with violence. Um, and I think it is important that we remember that, um, that, that we understand that it is our responsibility if we want to live in a society that adheres to these aspirations about free speech, that they depend upon our willingness to engage in counter speech, our willingness to speak our minds and defend those who are attacked and who are harmed. Um, and that's essential to the way in which a free society uh, should operate. So with that, I wanna thank all of you for coming. And of course, to thank Nadine and Marianne for a wonderful discussion. Um, and to thank the Chicago Humanities Festival uh, for hosting uh, this uh, terrific event. So thank you all very much and have a good evening.